Hello, hello, welcome. What a wonderful waterfall of people coming in. Six, seven pages of, of beautiful faces or beautiful black boxes, but we know your faces are behind there. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, just a really uh, fantastic thing to see this many people joining. Hello. Nearly 300. Uh, how fantastic. Okay, so I can say hello, bonjour, hola, white and gesic quiet in the indigenous languages of my place. Uh, my name is Jade. I'm part of the team at the Outdoor Learning Store. So we're a North American wide and global uh, charitable social enterprise that offers outdoor learning equipment and resources for educators and learners. And we're working hard to support other educational nonprofits across mm. the world too. Mm. So we work closely with Take Me Outside mm. and they are our partner in delivering this workshop. Um, today I join you from the traditional and unceded territories of the Snipes people, the people of the bull trout. Um, where I live in what's now known um, colonially as Revelstoke in British Columbia, it's the interior, is actually the confluence of many important rivers. There's also been incredibly uh, important for the Sequetmuk, Shushwap Lakes people, the Okanagan Silks, uh, Grassland, uh, First Nations and the Tanaha people out to the east who all live and long and share in the um, fruitful uh resources of the Columbia River. So I'm very grateful to join you uh, as an uninvited guest in this place. So for us within Turtle Island in North America, um, land-based learning must honor the traditional knowledge of the indigenous populations who've lived in relationship with this land for millennia. So we ask you now, if you do have this knowledge, please share in the chat which indigenous territory you're joining us from. If you're living in on traditional and unceded territory and you don't know whose land you're on, you can visit native-land.ca. Uh, it actually covers the entire globe, indigenous populations from across the globe, and you can learn more there. And land acknowledgements, look, they're just the start. They're the start for relationship building with indigenous First Nations or native groups. But it is um, the first step in, in acknowledging the truth of this place. And so thank you so much for doing that if you have access. And February is Black History Month in Canada. So I'd also like to just take a moment to honor the legacy of black people in Canada uh, and their communities. They have varied histories, successes, sacrifices, and triumphs in relationship to the natural world and the outdoors as well. And I welcome uh, and celebrate them here in this moment. Over to you, Steph. Thanks, Jade. And it's lovely to be here. So I'm Steph. Uh, I work with Take Me Outside, and so on behalf of our organization and now our 50 plus outdoor learning partners, we're really happy to be here this evening and helping support the virtual workshop. So I'm joining you from uh, Vancouver Island in British Columbia, Canada, which is Coast Salish territory. And more specifically, where I am is Kowatsin territory, so land of the Cowichan tribes and the Hokaminam speaking people. And I'm very grateful to be uh, back on this land where I grew up. And after a, a bit of a hiatus, I'm I'm back and learning, uh, trying to learn some of the language as well. So Haichka, thank you for joining us here tonight. Thanks, Steph. Um, so welcome. Uh, we're going to dive into the, the real good stuff shortly here, we're just to do a little bit of an introduction. And um, thank you so much. We want to think of this as a place of partnership, growth, caring and sharing for everyone who's here. Uh, these workshops are for you and us to learn together. Um, and we take, uh, we just want to thank you and, and encourage you to thank yourselves for taking the time to support uh, outdoor and environmental learning. Um, you know, the presenters and creators of our resources or of the uh, sort of expert knowledge in this field uh, and all of the people that you're going to take this away to uh, will be so grateful for that knowledge too. Um, we believe and the science proves that this work uh, really matters for the physical, social, emotional and academic well-being of young people and beyond. Um, so we're really glad you're investing your time into learning more about it here tonight and we, we're here with you and we're so grateful. Um, if you're just joining us, welcome. Zoom 101. Any questions you have throughout the presentation, any ideas that come up or questions you would like to pose to Pamela and Janice, our presenters, please type them in the chat. Steph and Duncan are working hard behind the scenes to collate them. We put them in a document and then we'll pose them at the Q&A at the end. Um, please stay muted. It just helps us stay focused um, on the voices. You can leave your video on if you like. It's nice to present to faces. Um, closed captions. If you click the more button with three dots at the bottom, if you have any uh, hearing impairment, you can turn on closed captions uh, and that will give a, a live transcript, which is yeah, hopefully accurate there for you. 
Um, we're going to have a presentation, Q&A, some prizes right at the end with a little quiz, so please stay to the end. Uh, you'll get access to a recording of this, a discount code for resources at the Outdoor Learning Store, and a certificate of attendance via a link that will be emailed to you after the workshop. Please check your spam folder if you don't see anything by noon tomorrow. Okay, just so we do have a little bit of an understanding of what's going on, um, I'm going to launch a quick poll. So hopefully you can see that. Um, I asked for your Indigenous knowledge, which I greatly appreciate. Um, but I wonder if people would like to answer the poll and share with us what's going on. And Steph, in true fashion, I see no responses. So I wonder if you might like to control the responses. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see the results. Um and we've got a lot of folks from Western Canada, Eastern Canada, everywhere is represented across Canada and the US, and five folks from elsewhere on the planet. But please share in the chat where you're joining us from, because we can only put so many options on the poll. So please type in the chat if you couldn't get specific enough. Okay, and then a second poll for you is who are you? So we'd love you to share, uh, you know, are you a particular grade teacher are you early childhood are you teaching in a more informal setting are you an admin person who have we got in the room Steph uh it looks like it's still going for a minute here uh kindergarten to grade three and four to six very well represented um a good amount good handful of secondary educators lots of forest school early childhood and some a good smattering of admin and folks in the community, parents, supporters. Please share in the chat. The, there's a dozen of you that are from none of the above. So we always love to hear where people are joining us from. Well, thank you so much. And this just goes to show for us, educator is such a broad term and outdoor education is for everyone. It's equitable and it's uh, it's a wonderful place to be. So it's so exciting to see all of you here. I'm just going to take 30 seconds um, to show you a really quick um, uh, slideshow so that I can... Um, introduce and share with the partners of the people that uh, make this possible. And so I invite you, and I'm excited to see you here for the Winter Virtual Workshop Series. Uh, today is February 7th, and we are taking Math Outdoors Practical Ideas and Examples. Uh, here we have our international partners, our partners from the US, and a couple of pages of fantastic partners from across Canada who helped get us to this place where we have so many engaged people connected into this world. And um, we've got some fantastic resources about maths uh, in the store, which I believe Pamela and Janice might allude to uh, in their presentation. But uh, for now, here we are to the main event and I will pass it over in just a moment. So joining us uh, today from Learning for a Sustainable Future, Pamela Gibson. Uh, Pamela is a career-long classroom teacher with K-10 experience and has been taking students outdoors for decades. To get a curriculum, she uses a hands-on experiential approach, uh, place-based outdoor learning and inquiry. She sounds great to us. Uh, welcome, Pamela. And Janice. Uh, Janice is an elementary teacher with a passion for learning outdoors and in the community. Janice has been using the sustainable development goals in her classroom to help children become more informed as citizens uh, who take action and make a difference in their communities. And so with that, I'll stop sharing. I'll pass it over to you and welcome you for the workshop. Thank you, Jade. So do I need to share a screen again? Is that what I need to do, Jade? <laughs> so you, yes, indeed, Ian, and sharing your audio as well so we can listen to that fun video if we have time. Okay. How's that? Looking fantastic. Perfect. Okay, so welcome everybody. And we're really glad to be here from Learning for a Sustainable Future and talking about taking math outdoors, outdoors into nature and outdoors into the community. But before we get started, uh, we would like to acknowledge that this and the, the traditional territory of the original peoples is steeped in rich indigenous history and traditions. And as a community and individuals here today, we have the opportunity 
and the responsibility to honor and respect the land, the rock, the waters, the plant, the air, the animals, and the ancestors. And in the spirit of truth, and respect, we honor and acknowledge those peoples who have been in this area for many thousands of years and who still live on this land. And we delight also to acknowledge the importance of incorporating indigenous ways of knowing into our actions. They provide us with those essential uh, knowledge to protect and honor the earth and to respect her gifts. And we would like to say both Janice and I live on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nations. So today's a tasting menu, and we'll say that because we could have gone on and on and on, and hopefully we won't. But uh, we are going to explore um, a relevant and meaningful math approach. Locations and context for math, math with community partners, and to give you some resources to guide us. Uh, but always after a brief look at sustainability, sustainability being the big word. So these are the sustainable development goals and oftentimes people think that they are about the planet and indeed they are, but they're also about the people because we are the ones responsible for what's going on around here uh, to a great extent. They're about our prosperity, our peace and our partnerships and without all of those things we cannot create a sustainable so we're going to be talking uh, and encouraging you to be looking at these goals and to be using them with your kids. And when you're talking about that big word sustainability so that they can understand that it's a complex subject and that it involves a lot of different aspects. Learning for a sustainable future um, has given a response to the need to infuse our schools with um, sustainable teaching. And they've created the Sustainable Future School Initiative. It's a whole school approach to sustainability in our schools to move us forward to the future we want. And in this framework, it shows us the need to develop awareness in our kids, awareness of the world around them and their place in it in order to create caring relationships. And that awareness can promote those. So don't skip the awareness part or getting outside and getting into the community and that, that caring piece as well, because understanding and action rests upon them. So what are the stepping stones toward education for sustainability? Well, we're characterizing it by asking three questions. How do we as educators move from creating successful students in the classroom to creating successful citizens in our communities? And how can we have both? And we're here to say, yes, you can. And how can we evolve our practice to bring about the real change we would love to see? And how can we inspire our students to become those informed, active, effective citizens? So let's continue to ask ourselves these questions as we proceed through this presentation and into our practice. A little food for thought about um, curriculum. Often educators like us, we stress about covering curriculum and understandably so, because we're mandated to do just that. It's akin sometimes though to taking a fire hose and spraying kids with information. Oh, they get covered and we get that job done, but we know that an information dump approach does not equate with meaningful learning. And the fire hose approach is usually not relevant for kids, not one bit inspiring or interesting to, to them. But when we situate learning where it fits, like that picture on the right, it becomes rich. Um, it, we can plainly see how uh, a, a type of uh, education that, that is akin to that river picture leads us into some pretty meaningful applications and applications for our math skills as well. So just to let you know that all the pictures you're gonna see are from our school and things that we've done. So they're not just random internet pictures. And we just wanted to let you know there's a lot of information on these slides so that um, you can go back and and use it again. Uh, the walk is the most effective way to dial into your surroundings and experience curriculum. So while we're sharing this webinar and all of the examples, I want you to put on your math lenses and start to visualize your schoolyard and your community. So I want you to think about the buildings, the signs, as well as the nature out there. I also want you to focus on the question aspect of math. You know, what kind of questions can you see your grade level posing? 
Asking children to ask questions about math is an easy way to help them feel confident in their math abilities. So feel free to share you know, any ideas you have in the chat as well so that other people can see what you're thinking. There are many wonderful resources to support you in your quest to take math outdoors. Lizanne Flatt's Math in Nature series helps us to see the outdoors season by season, every season, and do not skip out on the winter. It's fabulous out there. And Juliet Robertson's Methy, Messy Maths is loaded with ideas and activities to inspire you to get out there and connect math to more outdoor time with your kids. And you can find all of these resources and more on the Outdoor Learning Store website. So let's look at some common locations around our schools where math can happen. Math on the asphalt inside the chain link fence. Math on your grass or snowy play, playground or schoolyard. Math in your local built and cultural communities. And math in your local green spaces and parks. So this section is all about ideas to get you thinking about how to get started. So I want you to start about thinking about the things that you do inside that you can just do outside your door. So some examples that you can see in these pictures involve activities that can take a minimum amount of time and, you know, like looking at shapes and patterns outside, comparing rainfall in different areas on your schoolyard or classifying and sorting things like materials, like sticks and stones. Um, then there are longer, more involved projects. You could be creating obstacle courses for your class or other classes. You could be measuring, building, creating garden boxes, which you can see in the background. And that was for lettuce and strawberries. And at the end, it was a strawberry salad picnic at the end of the year. So um, we've also worked with other organizations and built a roof with shingles and a rooftop garden to compare the temperature. So think about the SDG number three, good health and well-being, and how would that connect to being outside with students? If you have any more ideas, feel free to put them in the chat for other people to see. So math on your playground could include simple activities like creating an ant playground, which the girls are doing on the left, counting and measuring dandelions, looking for spider webs um, and geometry involved in that. More complex activities might include shadows and tracking them over time or creating different types of gardens. Think about what you would need to make a pizza garden and the math involved. Um, the planting of different species and spacing, as well as the design. You could work with a lot of data when you're purchasing plants or creating a watering schedule. If you do want to create a garden on your schoolyard, ask the students what their thoughts are before you start. Make sure they're included. When we looked outside in the garden put in by our board one year, we had a big discussion about native species and then how we knew what the plants were and whether they were native or not. So then it became a bigger project. So when the students wanted to work with local stores and encourage their customers to purchase more native plants. Uh, my advice is to take an existing garden on your schoolyard if you have one, rather than go through the red tape of in, uh, in creating a new one, just because that becomes difficult. And you know, if you do have to create a new one, certainly make sure the students are involved in the whole process. And then think about how these activities might allow you to start discussions around sustainable industry, innovation, and infrastructure. The next two slides focus on math in your communities. Again, this can be simple things like counting cars, watching birds or squirrels, doing tallies about the number of times they come back to the nest. We're lucky enough to have cliff swallows on our school that build nests every year, so we can spend a lot of time doing math with them. Look for signs in your neighborhood. That can provide a ton of math. You can simply find and compare numbers. And if you want to do more complex things, you can figure out what vehicles could travel on which roads in your communities. On the next slide, you'll see comparing grocery items, starting to look at pollution in the vehicles you see, or even migration dates for different species that you find. So think about UN goal 11. So making cities and human settlements inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. How could this goal be included in your community walks? What about goal seven, affordable and clean energy? Can you think of other of UN goals that you could bring in? Taking these walks a bit further, you can start thinking about math in your local green spaces and parks. 
So if you design and create community gardens, you need to figure out, again, planting budgets, as well as perhaps selling produce. Um, you could do a lot with different grade levels. You could talk about litter. You could do a litter audit with the older grades. Again, look at the UN goals here. How does, you know, goal two, no hunger relate to community gardens or clean water and sanitation relate to litter? So when we think about math education as a stepping stone to citizen awareness, caring and action, math takes on a whole new energy for your students. Here are some different contexts in which math that also is work on the, meaningful. Uh, the yes. Math as an integrated inquiry or a project with other subjects in context for responsible citizenship, solving a problem, bettering our life, or math when one inquiry morphs into another, like an integrated outdoor project. One thing always leads to another. And math is a result of a question raised on a regular walk on your schoolyard or your community. We talked about regular walks, extremely important. That's how they start to dial into what's going on around them. And math as part of a community initiative or an event in your neighborhood, all of our communities have tons of things going on and we can tap into those and piggyback with them. And of course, math with other people, community partners, those people that live and work in our communities. So this is an example of an integrated project that I did with grade fours and they were involved in creating a wildlife corridor at the back of the schoolyard. So they learned about different tree and bush species height, widths, and they made decisions about where the species should be placed. They talked to experts and learned about invasive species affecting certain trees. And then if you look on the next slide, even more math, the students had to start by creating maps of the space. They had to go out and physically measure the area and perimeter. And they had to figure out the space based on the number of trees, the bushes, um, as well as the spacing between the trees and bushes. And they had to figure out sun and shade lengths, the cost of the species, a budget. Um, there was a ton of real math involved and a lot of motivation to learn it. Um, so thinking about your grade level, what could you do? The next example is how the same grade four students started another project based on what they had learned during the wildlife corridor. They had learned that there was an invasive species called an ash, emerald ash borer. So they decided to try a scientific experiment by putting worm castings on the trees to see if this helped to prevent the invasive species. Um, and then the worm castings became this project in itself. So they wanted to sell this valuable commodity and they had to market it. So this involved packaging and volume labeling, measurement, selling, pricing. They were looking at profit margin. Then the money they made, they used to fundraise for other sustainable projects in their community. So you're looking real, at real math, which equates to motivated students. And if you think about the UN goal 15, life on land, um, how are these trees impacted because of this invasive species? So being outside regularly and becoming aware of the critters around them can often lead kids to ask questions like, where do squirrels find food? Especially in the winter. And this is an invitation to us as educators to start an inquiry that can be loaded with math. It's a matter of knowing your curriculum, finding it, teasing it out of what the students notice, as well as infusing math into the resulting projects. So will they last a day or a month? Well, that depends where it goes and it depends on student interest. But again, being outside regularly is the key for having this occur. So I alluded, I alluded to questions and I wanted you to think about math um, by looking at this chipmunk and some questions that you automatically think about. So the goal here is to get children moving from asking level one questions to asking questions that are a little bit more like level three and four questions is what we would call them. Um, but you need to practice this sort of thing. So just by looking at this picture and thinking about a level one question, what could you ask about this picture? And that's just, you know, something like how many acorns do you see? The level one questions usually have an obvious answer and there isn't much to build on. The next question might be how many acorns can she fit in her mouth? 
this becomes more challenging investigation and students have to combine data get, to get the answer. Then you can get into questions like how many acorns will she need for the winter, which is definitely more complex. And then students have to, have to justify their answers. And they may or may not be correct, but they're making educated guesses. If we decided we wanted to connect an SDG to this chipmunk, then it can easily become more of a level four math question. And what if we focused on goal 14 climate change? What would be a great math question about climate change, chipmunks and acorns? So my question to you guys is, um, you know, what do you think, do you think that you can address different math concepts in your grade with chipmunks and acorns? So, you know, if you have any questions, please feel free to, to add them to the chat. This video here, when you get a chance to look at it, is a kindergarten's interviewing a tree. And they come up with some really great questions. And I thought it would be really interesting to work with another older class on trying to solve some of these questions that they ask. When students take a device and go outside and start looking for examples of math quest questions, it gets really interesting. And the kids in the photo are wondering how many diamonds are in a section of chain link fence and how might they calculate in such an answer? They're pretty young and they can bring their question inside and sit with another couple of students and come up with their best estimate based on their calculation hypothesis. And they can get pretty close in that regard. And the debates that ensue are pretty rich. So what's going on in your school community? That's our question tonight. Community events, festivals, kids can get pretty involved with lots of math opportunities and time outdoors. Getting involved in local fall fairs, for instance, and contests can motivate students to do their best. I love this picture of the kindies who are involved in growing the largest sunflowers. And they love to see the fruit of their labors at festivals. And they accomplished a lot of math and they won the contest. And that's just the bonus. So this was my motivated group of four and five-year-olds learning to say some big numbers in order to promote a local food waste challenge. The interesting part was of course, helping them see these big numbers, you know, 1.2 million tomatoes. What does that look like? Do you think it would fill the school, the schoolyard? If you counted to a million, it would take you 23 days. Even understanding the concept of time. Uh, the students went on to grow food indoors and outdoors and organized watering schedules as well as, as well as they measured plant height. And then the UN goal number two, no hunger became part of the discussion and collecting food was the action that they chose to take. So we want you to hear them and listen carefully for those big numbers. Food waste is a big problem. Some people don't get any food every day in Canada. We waste 470,000 lettuce heads, 750,000 loaves of bread. 555,000 bananas, 2.4 million potatoes, 1 million cup of milk, 1 million tomatoes, 450,000 eggs. Food waste across Canada, 40, $49 billion a year. 11.2 million tons. Food waste can be rescued to feed people in Canada. Wasting food is bad for the environment too. Sign up for Eco Calendar. Food waste challenge. Just eat it. Let's see if our community can waste less food. So 
So uh, don't you love it? I mean, you loved their art too. And they were drawing and painting about food. Uh, quite amazing what kids can do when they're motivated. And they certainly were motivated to give their message and to share what they had learned, which always it just blows me away. So Janice? So another easy way to get involved in CMAP is with local festivals. Bell Fountain was involved in helping with the Salamander Festival every year in our town. And the students here are scooping out squash bowls for the no waste soup that is served in the squash halves. So obviously you can see math here, halves, the number of bowls and soup, how much. How much soup does one squash make? Are you still there, Janice? Anyway, the students have uh, tried to grow squash every year for the festival, but some years only a few squashes have been produced. So then what do you do? Well, they have to have backup. They have to have a plan B. So this is real life. And uh, besides all of that great math, it's also an opportunity to talk about food waste and the UN goal number two, no hunger and several other sustainable goals, all while raising awareness for an endangered salamander species that was local to them. So Janice, I think she's having trouble with her internet, but we'll just carry right on here. Often by connecting with community partners, their already existing projects can be made um, even larger and math can really come alive. And here's a list of our potential partners for you to think about in your community. Uh, parents who have interesting jobs or hobbies, community members, organizations, local businesses, uh, ministries or the departments around you. Some of them have an education mandate and they are looking for you to partner up with. So take advantage of all those things. This is a community member, a local one to where we, we uh, to our school. And that parent uh, brought the grade fours and helped us to, um, to boil down sap. And you look at that, uh, well, ratio is a lot easier to learn about when you see oodles of your sap going up in smoke, so to speak. So tougher concepts make more sense when there is an experience and things are hands on. Here's an, another example. This is a community member that a parent brought in to the grade fours and uh, the grade fours helped to monitor northern flying squirrels in the area. The students built nesting boxes, they measured trees, they figured out which species the squirrels seemed attracted to, as well as positioning the boxes according which direction they needed to be. They monitored uh, the locations, they recorded the height of the boxes and managed all the data, data, uh, including which squirrels nested where and when and the size of the squirrels and the number of babies they had. And if you look at that picture on the left, you can see that they're just pretty intensely uh, interested in what they're doing. Another organization in the area helped uh, students to create some bluebird bo boxes that were <clears throat> put out on the schoolyard and then of course monitored. Um, just some of the math was figuring out spacing of the boxes once again, but they also got into cost of materials and there was a lot of financial literacy. Measuring, measuring data, management here. It was tons of stuff going on. And of course they were just having a fine time doing a real world thing to help out the species that was local to them. So even youngest students can be, can be concerned about the most interesting things. And here's an example of the kindies becoming very interested in the wind on the playground and found out that there could be a windbreak. And they worked with the conservation authority to figure out um, how they could build such a thing. And of course, you know, they had to figure out the usual suspects, spacing, planting depth, and number of trees in order to put up this wind barrier. So um, we've connected everything to the SDGs so you can see because we do that with the kids too. So they can see they're working toward a sustainable future. Working with a local business, um, the students helped to design this metal turtle. 
that would raise aware awareness of a local turtle that was a species of concern in our area. And they went to the local businesses and found out that they could uh, get someone to build this turtle. So they learned all about the math involved in creating it and um, the possible costs of creating more of these art pieces in the community. So it became an art project as well. So once again, we're looking at integrating all of the subjects you teach together. Uh, and usually they include tons of math as well. So your local ministry or department of natural resources, and I don't like that name, it's sort of testy, but anyway, um, often they have education mandates as well. And as I said before, they're looking for you to pair up with them. Great things can happen. And here you see uh, some students weighing and measuring fish from their local river, the credit, uh, as a larger study about the health of the river. And there was tons of real world math. Notice I keep saying that. And the experiences were memorable. I love that word, very important word. And working with the Ministry of Natural Resources, these students were involved in stocking salmon. And they had a, a hatchery in their classroom. They raised salmon eggs. They checked out the survival rate. They talked about the benthic macro invertebrate studies and all kinds of other things to do with fish. And of course, all of these experiences involve math. And they motivated them to learn the difficult math because they were involved in uh, producing a report for um, this um, the ministry. And again, it was their hook, understanding the importance of introducing a species back into the Credit River uh, was the impetus for them to do a really fine job of it. So here is some considerations um, that I think we all need to take a look at. After seeing all these number of examples and thinking about your math class, I wonder what you consider to be your math goals. And these are ours. Are we making math meaningful, memorable? I love those M words. Are we making use of our students' interests? and what's around them, their previous experiences and their knowledge. In other words, are we getting them outside? Can we learn to ask math stimulating questions and teach kids to ask interesting probing questions at, uh, as well? And the whole idea of this is living in the question, right? Not always going directly to the answer. There's a lot of interesting debate and talk and figuring out by living in the question. If you haven't heard of Dan Myers, well, he's worth listening to. We added these videos, you can check them out when you get this, this slide deck or when you look at the recording. Um, he speaks to high, high school math teachers, but I want you to think about his message and how you could do what he does with your students. He gets them out into the real world and asks real world questions. So once again, remember, one of the important things about math learning is developing confidence and student interest because it affects their motivation. It affects whether they persevere and their performance and how they see themselves. And sometimes kids come to me and they say, oh, I, I, how are you doing in school? Oh, I'm fine, but I don't do very well in math. And that really concerns me and worries me because um, their confidence level is low. So anything we can do to show them that they can do these things and that they can be math literate and that they can live their, their math lives happily is a great idea. So the goal, is to get students to see, understand, find, and use math everywhere, and to feel confident enough to take risks, to hypothesize, to offer possible solutions to problems without the fear of always being wrong. So primary students start by getting out there and learning to ask those math questions, as Janice said earlier, about their surroundings. They get interested in math and how it helps us in our real world. And those junior students and beyond can make, um, make it work with 
student photos and the outdoors, real world connections and all those examples that we saw. And it teaches them the value of math. So think about your math approach and ask yourself these questions. Does your math approach encourage students to come up with higher complex questions? Is it interesting enough for an inquiry? Can you assess thought provoking questions and the quality of their hypotheses and not just their paper pencil tests? Do these questions lead your students to more critical thinking and give them a broader understanding of the world around them and sustainability. So as you go forward, there are some final thoughts we have for you. Know your curriculum so well that you see it everywhere around you. We love to say, see through your curriculum glasses because then you're gonna think about math in nature around you. Not in nature around where my school is, nature around you. And what are the interesting opportunities for projects that will inevitably include math? Think about math in your schoolyard. What opportunities are there to engage with your curriculum, whether you're in kindergarten or grade eight or anything in between? Think of math close to your school. What interesting questions and opportunities are out there in your community? And speaking of your community, what partnerships are there for you to develop and to get at curriculum through that? To be part of that great turnings toward sustainable teaching. So remember, the math should serve the student and not the other way around. That's a Dan Myers quote. Use math to stimulate awareness and caring about our planet and give your students the opportunity to become those informed, active citizens for a sustainable future. And connect your math learning with the SDGs. It's oh so possible, especially when you get outside for math. I come just in time. You did. You came to, to do the credits, Janice. Welcome back. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love computers. <laughs> um, so these are just a lot of links that will help support you if you're interested in learning more or needing more ideas and resources. Um, R4R is the database that has over 1,500 resources that you can search based on your province, your curriculum, or the SDG that you're interested in. So um, lots of activities and great ideas for you to do. And always, of course, feel free to contact Pamela or myself if there's any, if you have any questions or have any ideas that you'd like to share. Um, so that's this, the next slide as well, Pamela, is more resources. There's youth forum programs. And of course, you can check out the, the Sustainable Future brochure. So yeah, thank you. Thanks for coming back, Janice. Okay. <laughs> I was frozen. Ah, uh, speaking of partners, eh? <laughs> so thanks everybody for coming out. We hope we we inspired you with a few examples uh, from our practice, and we know it's doable because we do it, and uh, that should give you confidence. And I know we're preaching to the choir here, but uh, thanks for coming out, and hopefully we have lit a few fires. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, let's roll into some some question and answers. And if you do have any Q and A, um, type them in the chat, and uh, Steph will grab them and and put them into the document. So Alex Robles asks, what tips do you have for teachers who have limited green space in their school? Um, this person's school is in the heart of Los Angeles. Uh, they keep the school incredibly keen. They rake up all the leaves. There are no stones, no rocks. What are we doing? Do you want to take that, Janice? Do you want? <laughs> Oh, she got again. Well, Sorry, no, no, I'm here. You're here. Okay. <laughs> I am. So I would say that uh, you guys have a lot of advantages that we wouldn't in a, in a green space where you can, you know, use your neighborhood and walk around and you've got lots of math and buildings and geometry and things like that. So I certainly would expand where I'm moving around to um, with that if I was working there. And also you can, if you can think it, you can 
managed to do that in your schoolyard. I've seen things with, you know, people bringing in old tires and filling it with soil and having tomato plants. And, you know, um, some of the, the Toronto schools are digging up pavement and putting shade trees in. So, and there's a lot of um, resources for funding. So uh, you can certainly find funding in different areas as well. And I will, I will say that I taught in the city for 14 years and uh, Janice is right on. I mean, for me, it was all about the buildings and the community and what was going on and the lo whatever was local. I was lucky enough to have um, a bit of a stream that I could walk to, um, but I, I, you'll laugh at this. I used to have people call the school and say, do you know there's a teacher down here with students? Because <laughs> it was so unusual to have anybody there. So uh, just use what you've got. But the, the important thing is to get them out so that they have that sense of belonging and they have that sense of real math. Buildings, geometric shapes, they're amazing. Uh, thank you. Uh, Cairo was asking about ideas for fractions outside. Fractions specifically. Oh my gosh. Well, I would think gardens, if you were doing some garden stuff, that's where I would go to for fractions for sure. Um, Pamela, do you have any ideas for fractions? Oh, I think I think fractions are involved in any of the things that we've talked about for mm -hmm. sure. Um, yeah, there. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I'm a bit baffled by the question because uh, certainly <laughs> so specific. If you have to divide your garden up into four equal pieces, or if you have to, you know, whatever you're doing, or the wall has, uh, you know, seventy two br bricks on it, you can do a heck of a lot with fractions with that brick wall. At least Sharing space. Mind. Yeah, uh, car go. tires in the parking lot, looking at the different um, shapes of the spokes within the wheels and then comparing them to bicycles. If anyone's got a bicycle there, yeah. uh, if you live in an urban um, environment, um, making piles of stuff, pine cones, leaves, and then trying to sort them into piles of that's a half, that's a quarter and just get them hands on touching. I've definitely done a lot with that. Or even traffic studies where you're trying to figure out what portion or what fraction of the the vehicles that go by your school are SUVs or trucks or or, or are red and green if they're young kids or whatever. Um, so um, yeah. what fraction? Any, of them? Yeah, yeah, birds, birds. Looking at fraction, <laughs> birds for sure. There's so much. Just, just yeah. Get your math lenses on. You'll come up with a thousand things probably. Okay, uh, Roxanne was asking about the sustainable self uh, diagram, um, but it seemed to me, are you going to make the slide deck available as well as the recording? Okay, so we'll send that in the follow up email um, for everybody and then you'll be able to get in there with the um, looking at those slides again. Um, Melissa said if they wanted to find out what companies and organizations have educational pieces and would want to connect with us, how, how do you go about building those relationships? Oh, Janice is the community partner queen. Go ahead, Janice. <laughs> well, I've done things with um, parents bringing me community partners, and that's how we got Steve the Squirrel Guy. Um, but I've also done things with just, I do, I will go on um, our Credit Valley website and see what they're doing and what they're involved in. Uh, a lot of these places have mandates to work with classes and students. So I reach out to them and say, how can we help? And anytime I work with community, that's how I, you know, I don't ask for things. I ask them what we can do to help them promote food waste um, festivals or, you know, promote other things in their community. And that's how I usually get involved with them. And then when they have things happening, they bring it to, to us a lot of times. So we have partnerships that we've had for years and years. Um, your gardeners in your community, they usually are doing something with schools as well. So uh, partnerships are great and you can do some really awesome projects with them and it's, it, the kids can really get involved. We've done something with Fashion Takes Action. That's a Canada wide one and the kids um, did a video for them as well. So uh, these are kindergartens doing that. So you guys can do fantastic things. Sounds like just find someone you're interested in, reach out to them and see and see whether you can... Um... See whether they have something. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of you. ask your parents because you know their businesses in your community, um, and even when you're walking around talking to community businesses or members. It's all about the walk. 
go go get to know your community. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Okay, Candice asks, how can you bring learning outdoors in a school that requires students to stay inside except during recess? Um, <laughs> Firstly, they need to look at some of the research from the Canadian um, Nature Network or from some other, you can go to Take Me Outside and, and they need to share that with their school list system administrators to show how important outdoor learning can be for academic outcomes. Um, but um, could you use videos or PowerPoints or teacher or them bringing items in to look at in the classroom? Advice? Well, I'm sad, first of all, to hear that there's still some of that happening. Uh, certainly at the beginning of my career, that was common. It's less common now, um, but uh, you have to, obviously you're a, an advocate, so keep advocating. Um, one thing I always did was that when the bell rang, because we had bells, you know, in those days, um, I didn't take kids in. We always met at a certain spot. And if we did nothing else, we, we gathered in a circle and I would say to them, what's going on out here today? And then we would go in five or 10 minutes later. We just sort of stretched that a little bit or we would go out early before recess started or whatever and and that's the way you can sort of start to get your foot in the door and for your administration or whoever to understand that this is not threatening and it's a very important thing to do and as as jade said also hand them the literature but i i'm sorry you're in that position yeah. uh, but another it's idea another idea might to bring um you know there's gardens and like we have a rain garden that we had just put in the last couple of years and it's right outside the windows. And so um, they put in birds, baths and bird food and things like that. So there's species that are coming to their space as well. So they can see, you know, um, different things happening and use, use the outdoors <laughs> visually through their windows. <laughs> so that could That's help great. a little bit. Mm -hmm. And people are sharing, yeah, do things, bring a login, look at you things using a microscope, do scientific observations from the windows. I've done rock sorting um, exercises where I go and grab bags of different rocks from outside walks and they have to get the kids to sort them based on a, their own classification and give them two minutes to make the categories and then mix them up again and ask them to do it with a different category and get them thinking about uh, what that looks like. Um, yeah, yeah really amazing that um, Dan Myers video it's it's for high school he's he's all about high school but it's about taking pictures um, and bringing that in and getting the kids asking questions about pictures so that might be a way that you could do that having the kids you know take pictures of things in their world having to do with the outdoors and bringing it in yeah bringing the outdoors in is what uh, educators have done for decades so it's a start right and mm -hmm. as you said then uh, something happening right outside your outside your classroom for years I used to boil sap down just outside my classroom with with a two two uh, burner stove with a an extension cord stuffed out the window and they could see what was going on so yeah you got to just keep um, pushing pushing your way out the door Good luck with that. Um, you mentioned high school. We'll do one more question from the list that relates to high school and then we'll do a really soft close for people that might need to leave bang on the hour. And then um, if you're happy to stick around for maybe another 10 minutes or so, because we've got prize giving. And then after that, we can answer a couple more of these questions if people have an extra 10 or 15 minutes. Um, so this last question from Candice, um, oh, sorry, Emma, what resources or tips do you recommend for high school teachers, specifically those trying to get students interested in high level math? Mm -hmm. Some yeah, that's, more tough, complex that's tougher things. for us. That's tougher for us because we're elementary, but um, there's definitely, like I was saying about Dan Myers, look into that because he's pretty cool and he does uh, video and things like that and does higher level math with that, which is really interesting. Um, and that's how I kind of got into the questioning stuff with the elementary students that I do. Um, more than that, Pamela, I mean, we should certainly, if you text us or email us, we can find information for you from some of the high school uh, people that we work with. They might have some better ideas about resources and things could, that could be helpful to you. Can I make a suggestion? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> we did leaf, um, we, we gathered the leaves and we talked about the different angle pairs for geometry, uh, you know, um, acute angles, obtuse angles, 
uh, linear pairs, vertic vertical angles, that type of thing, and the different um, leaves that are out, especially during the fall. And they're fun to make and you iron them between wax paper and then you can have them draw them and measure them. Beautiful, Judy. Thanks for sharing. I also do a lot with, um, and it ties into the environmental thing of um, getting them to build their own balloon barometers or just starting to collect metadata from outside every morning about air temperature. Does that air temperature change from the beginning of the day to the end of the school day and start plotting graphs? If you live somewhere with snow, you can start doing snow profiles and looking at different layers and identifying if you've had a rain event or a sun event, whether you start to see layers. Um, if you have an opportunity to look at snowflakes uh, and look at the crystallization process or anything to do with shapes and numbers related to that. Um, but yes, we'll come back to you. OK, thank you so much, Janice and Pamela, for um, your fantastic presentation and for sharing so much information. There's a lot of information in those slide decks as well that will be available to you. Or you can watch a copy of the recording if you want to hear the voices again. And um, we're going to quickly um, just uh, share a couple of things before we uh, end up here. We have a couple more winter workshops. So tomorrow, Monique Grace Smith is joining us to talk about her uh, adaptation of braiding sweetgrass of Robin Wall Kimmerer's braiding sweetgrass for young adults. Rescheduled because she wasn't very well at the beginning of the season. So she's here tomorrow at the same time. We've got Green Emma and the Great Outdoors on uh, Feb 21st. We're learning about a people's curriculum for the earth on Feb 28th and school gardening winter leading into spring on March 7th. So if you're interested there, join in. OK, I've got four prizes to give away. These are typing prizes. So I need people limber, ready, fingers. I know you've been sitting for a while, maybe do a few stretches. And here's what it is. I've got four questions for you. The first two, um, beautifully donated by our friend Juliet Robertson. Um, she's giving away two copies of her uh, book, Messy Maths. So this is really exciting uh, and very relevant um, to this workshop. So the first two questions, you're getting two copies of a copy each of that and the next two questions are a $25 gift card to the take me outside store where they have beautiful ethically made um apparel and toques and caps and journals and so um hopefully you'll uh, you have a good one so here we go uh question one just has an answer it's the first correct fully correct spelt correctly <laughs> i'm going to be quite <laughs> firm about this in the chat box are you ready Question one, what is the perimeter of a circle called? I see it. Steph's got to scroll back up. <laughs> <laughs> I know it goes so fast. The first one coming up on my screen that is also spelled right is Nicole Vieira. Nicole Vieira, wonderful. Send Steph a private message with your email and whether you're in Canadian dollars or US dollars, and um, congratulations. Circumference is the perimeter of a circle in math. Okay, question two, people. Here we go. Feeling limber, feeling ready. I can see you all very excited. Uh, I'll explain what it is at the end. I had to look it up. Um, there's three answers waiting to the end. Which number is greater? A million, a Google, or a quadrillion? Which number is greater? A Google? A billion or a quadrillion? And I, I'm assuming, do we do we need the correct spelling for this one too? Oh, it's actually a toughie. Um, let's see. <laughs> I let's let's do it. Let's see if anyone can spell it right. <laughs> it is. I a think toughie I, it I think I see it. Oh yeah. If, oh, I think I see it too. Is it Jenna the first one here? I believe so. Jenna Reisk. Reisk. Yeah, Jenna, congrats. Congratulations. So a Google apparently is one times 10 to the power of 100. Mind blown. Numbers. I can't even comprehend that many zeros. I teach about the history of Earth of kids and try and do 4 billion with zeros. And even that, I just say it's much older than your grandma. OK, congratulations. Send Steph a message um, and we'll have a copy of Messy Maths winging its way to you. OK, now we're going to gift cards to take me outside. Question three. I'm going to give you uh, four options here. Wait until you've heard them all. Which of the following is not? Which of the following is not an example of a fractal? A, the number of spirals on a pineapple. B, coastlines. C, ferns. Or D, 
coral. Which of these is not an example of a fractal? What do we got? I will accept either the letter or the answer, I think. Steph? Yeah, I see Jenna Wright answering with the with coastlines. Yes, yeah, that is correct. The rest are fractals. Again, information to Steph, um, US or Canada, and your email, please. Congratulations. Uh, a fractal, for those, if you're not in the know, is a self-similar repeating shape uh, where it's seen again and again in the shape itself. Okay, last question here, people. Nicely, as you guess, there's a, mess, a maths theme. Um, which shape is linked to bees, snow, ice, and certain rock formations? Which shape? Oh, that's fast. Yeah, people are people know their their math shapes. <laughs> yeah, good job. After the first one popped up on my chat is Sarah Nekurek. Nekurek. I hope we're pronouncing it. Hi, it's Sarah. hard. Hello, Sarah. <laughs> oh, you got Hello. a friend. Okay, there we go. Hi, it's um, so good to see you. <laughs> <laughs> amazing well well done you both are getting a, a take me outside gift card um the last two and messy maths copies for the first two thank you so much and everyone um oh nearly 500 people here this evening if you do need to go we totally understand um but if you've got another 10 minutes we're going to answer a couple more of these questions while we've got the experts in the room and i thank you so much for your participation and for joining us this evening mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Okay, I'm going back to the questions because there were quite a lot. Okay, Thay's asked, um, okay, I think that was the same question um, as before about sort of higher level math, algebra and things. Or do you have any specifics with algebra? Anyone really into algebra? Maybe, but I, I will say that Janice is correct on this. It's get, you, get your nose out of the textbook and start looking around you for real wo world examples. Okay. Especially ones that have a solution that's going to lead us forward. Okay. And so um, a lot of the things I'm looking at, for example, with um, like data modeling, with climate modeling, um, with these amazing sort of uh, real world scenario things where you can have inputs and outputs and start looking at calculations with populations or uh, animals or, or weather inputs. I think for me, that's a great way to integrate algebra. Uh, and those kind of formulations into real life. So that's kind of where, where we're at. Okay, Alison has some older students, grade six, seven, who are struggling with critical thinking. How do we promote or lead them into curiosity and question asking? I was gonna say provocation. Um, I think that's the key. If you can create a, a provocation for them that's outdoors, that would be exciting. That's going to get them thinking. And also, also including them in all of your thinking and all of your uh, decision making is important as well. Because then there's buy-in and they feel like they have a voice. So I would make sure that any conversations I'm always bringing to them. What do you guys think? you know, uh, about everything. I, you know, our kids do daily physical activity every day and they said it was boring. I said, so, okay, let's figure it out. Let's have a discussion. How can we make it better? You know, so all of those conversations with the kids will help them uh, get more involved and, and give them a voice. Um, I've started, if you don't already have this in your practice, if you're taking them outside, you can start just with a, I think, like get them to look at something like a leaf and just say, I think, I wonder uh, and I notice and, and just start by asking them to, to do that. And you could do that like every day. You could go and look at a different thing. Oh, I, I think about, I wonder and I notice. And you could just do that practice again and again with different things and start to um, to wake up that part of their brain if that's if that's not something. And, and you know, quite possibly they're being suppressed for asking questions in other places. So be that place where they're like, what you have to say to me is important. What you have to say is is is, is valuable here. Um, amazing, thanks so much. Okay, um, just two- Emily's taken, I was gonna say just a, a cooperative game. When you started to take the older kids outside, you started with cooperative games, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, and I and I also think that that's the beauty of attaching everything to sustainability, and particularly the sustainable development goals, because they're full of critical questions 
Um, why is this happening? How, how did that come to be? Da, 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 da. And the more you encourage uh, that milieu of questions as opposed to answers, that I think we got off on the wrong track when everybody had to find the answer fast and move on. It, you know, one question should lead to another. And uh, that's where you get into deeper questions and not being so concerned always about um, simple, simple answers because things are complex by nature. And the more they, they look around them and they become aware of what's going on in their communities, the more they start, they start. But it takes a long time and you have to be out there um, giving them those experiences. So they start to see that and care about that stuff. And realistically, LSF, Learning for Sustainable Future, has another educational resource called Connecting the Dots, which if you're looking for a more sort of pedagogical, uh, it's quite thin and, and easy to access um, for all different age ranges of a way to sort of how to start posing these things and how to start shifting the way that you 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 teach into integrating these ideas. That's another resource to check out. I use it. <laughs> OK, um, last um question from manas oh sarah asked about grants in ontario um some classes are, are supporting are challenging their students to apply for them but the trick is finding them we do have some resources linked on the outdoor learning store you can go to funding and there's some options there learning for a sustainable future you have your 500 dollars action grant if you can make it into something that's um an action project any other thoughts TV canada trust yeah and ask your local credit unions our our uh, caledon has a green fund so i don't know if your city has a green fund so you can look into that um mm -hmm. biodiversity education awareness network had some funding before i don't know if they still do cwf canadian wildlife federation had some funding as well um so yeah um we haven't looked too far from our own community recently but yeah. Those are places that have a look in the chat. Steph's written about the Whole Kids Foundation and um, a couple of links in there. But yeah, at the outdoor learning store, we have some um, slash funding. There's some options there as well. OK, last question for everyone. Manas asks, I have the opportunity to work with school children in my neighborhood in North York. Uh, I teach them in an outdoor setting using a community garden um, that I helped to found about 10 years ago. Nice job. Um, how do I persuade the schools, though, to use the program? um oh do i need to enter my funding agency to enter a deal with the td this is the toronto district school board as a vendor it's free programming how do we get this into schools is, do you have any experience with that uh, <laughs> funny you should ask because learning for a sustainable future is is busy uh, also encouraging schools to take on this whole school approach to sustainability so um yeah it's working away Working your way at it. Yeah. Find your <laughs> superintendent, send emails. <laughs> I was going to say, there's usually somebody at the board that is responsible for sending out information to all the teachers, like an eco, there's in our board, there is an eco schools person that you, as, that you know, Jade. And um, there's also somebody that does sustainability at the board that also puts out information to teachers as well. Um, but uh, yeah, it is, you know, if, I think you really have to go through the kids because <laughs> the kids are the ones that are um, going to motivate Amazing, people. thanks. Sure. And there's some amazing ideas as well coming in the chat. And that's what's so amazing is this is a community of practice. That's why we're here. It's not just us to you. There's been so many amazing people contributing um, into the chat. So we thank you so much. Um, and with that, I will uh, say goodbye um, at the end here. Um, it's been fantastic to have you, Pamela and Janice. Thank you so much. Um, keep an eye out for future workshops coming up. And we've got some fantastic uh, learning opportunities through our Every Child Matters uh, Four Seasons of Reconciliation Indigenous Learning. You can have a look on our website and also uh, a new thing coming up uh, that's inspired by the walking curriculum by Dr. Gillian Judson. So we'll, if you liked the idea of walking around and, and get involved in things, we'll have some new stuff in. So uh, check your emails and we'll be sharing that with you soon. But for now, I'll say good night. Thank you so much. Gaisik uh, Um Goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.